I'm Peter Kutosh, and I'm going to talk about improved torsion point effects on SIDH variants, which is joint work with Victoria Decan, Chris Leonardi, Chloe Martindale, Lawrence Pony, Christophe Lutti, and Kate Stang. So isogeny-based crypto is based on the hard problem of finding isogenies between super elliptic curves. With the degree of the secret isogenies of the form L to the K, where L is some small prime number, and this can be interpreted as a pass-finding problem in the super singular isogeny graph. Best known algorithms for finding a degree D isogeny are then just meet in the middle algorithms, where you just do random walks from both endpoints and hope for a collision. This gives you an algorithm which has time complexity roughly square root of D, but requires a lot of memory, and the Bellon von Orskot Wiener algorithm gives a time memory trade-off. Nevertheless, uh, all known algorithms for this problem are exponential in the size of the input. However, most crypto systems, most prominently SIDH, are based on relaxations of this problem. So the natural question occurs, can one exploit this extra information somehow to beat generic to the middle algorithms? First, let me briefly recall super singular isogeny DP Hellman or otherwise known as SIDH. Let P be a prime number and let A and B be smooth co-prime integers. Let E0 be a super single optic curve over FP square. Then Alice picks a cyclic subgroup GA and computes the corresponding isogeny E0 over GA going from E0 to EA and sends the codomain of the secret isogeny EA to Bob. And Bob also picks a cyclic subgroup computes the corresponding isogeny and again sends the codomain of his secret isogeny to Alice. And then they want to compute the common shared secret, which is E0 over GA and GB. But just knowing the codomain of the other's uh, secret isogeny is not enough to compute this shared secret, so both have to send over some extra information. Namely, Alice sends over phi APB and phi AQB, where PB and QB should be the B torsion, and Bob sends over phi BPA, phi BQA, where PA and QA generate the A torsion. This motivates the following algorithmic problem, which we call the SSIT problem. Let phi be a secret isogeny of known degree A between two super single curves, E0 and EA. And suppose you also know phi PB and phi QB, where PB and QB generate the B torsion. And the problem is to compute phi. So our goal is to give certain conditions on A, B, and P, where P is the characteristic of the base field. And then we can solve this problem in polynomial time, or at least faster than generic algorithms. This is a relaxation of the well known uh, CSSI problem, which was introduced in the SIDH paper, where A and B are also required to be roughly the same size, and both have to be prime powers. So some remarks. So for this problem to truly make sense, you need uh, the B torsion to be efficiently representable, which you can do in many ways. So you could choose P to B to be power smooth. Uh, but most systems uh, use special primes to make sure that the B torsion is defined over a small extension field. In SIDH, A and B both divide P plus 1. And in B side, uh, which is a variant of SIDH, uh, a and B are chosen to divide P square minus 1. In both SIDH and B side, balance perimeters are used, meaning that A is roughly the same size as B, but that doesn't really provide any efficiency benefit. It just comes from the fact that you want the same security level for Alice and Bob. So the first attack, which exploited this uh, extra information, was by Petit 2017 Asia Crypt. And let me briefly recall what the attack does. So the main idea is to find a special endomorphism theta of the starting curve E0 and an integer d such that uh, phi theta phi hat plus d can be recovered from its restriction from EAB. And why does this help us? Because then you can compute the intersection of the kernel of tau minus d and the A torsion of the target curve, which will essentially give you the dual of phi modulo some technical details. And then the natural question, how do you find such a, uh, oh, uh, such a tau? So what uh, restrictions do you impose on theta? So you choose theta in a way that the degree of tau 
is b times e where uh, e is something small because then you can recover the b part of tau just uh, using the torsion point images and then the e part can be recovered by some meet in the middle algorithm and then the the next question is, how do you find such a theta? In general, when you know nothing about the uh, endomorphism ring of E0, then this is a hard problem because for generic random curves, you usually don't know any non-scalar endomorphisms. But in many applications, or actually most applications, a special starting curve is used, y squared equals x u plus x, which has a very particular endomorphism ring, which is known and has a special structure. Namely, it contains i and j with the property that i squared is minus 1, j squared is minus p. j is actually just a Frobenius map. And i times j is equal to minus j times i. And in this context, just finding a suitable theta is equivalent to solving uh, the following Diophantine equation, uh, a squared times uh, small a squared p plus b squared p plus c squared plus d squared equals b times e. Here we're looking for small a, small b, small c, and small d, and e. And we also have the actual condition that e should be small. So how do we solve such an equation? So first we solve it modulo a square, which will give us d. Then we solve it modulo p, which will give us c. And then uh, we hope that what we get is a sum of two squares. If not, then we iterate. And this is a viable way of solving this equation whenever b is bigger than p squared times a squared. So our main result concerns improving these methods in various ways. Uh, so let me start with our first improvement. So the first improvement is that it's actually enough for the degree of tau to be equal to b squared times e. And why is that? Because then tau can actually be composed as psi 1 a top psi 2 dual plus multiplication by m. Uh, where uh, the degree of psi 1 and psi 2 is b over m, and the degree of tau is e. And m is actually either 1 or 2. And uh, we can get most of the information about tau just by looking at tau modulo b. So tau modulo b is actually can be represented by a 2 times 2 matrix over z over pz. And the kernel of this matrix uh, is the kernel of psi 1. This was already used in Pratis attack. But then the image of this matrix is actually the kernel of psi 2. And the m can also be recovered from this matrix representation. The only part which cannot be recovered is the eta part, but again, uh, this, that part can be recovered by generic meet in the middle algorithm. An alternative way of thinking about this attack is just running Petit's attack twice, once with theta and then one with, with the dual of theta. And then essentially, with the first attack you recover psi 1, and with the second one, you recover the dual of psi 2. So another way of thinking about this attack is actually a reduction from finding a suitable theta with a suitable degree, and the other one being uh, the SSIT problem. So when the special when the starting curve is, is y squared equals to x squared plus x, then we have a very similar Diophantine equation to the previous one, except now we have b squared instead of b. And we can solve this whenever b is bigger than p times, p times a with the exact same method as before. Uh, but show, solutions should exist for a much wider variety of parameters, just we weren't able to find them. We give heuristics uh, on, on when this should be solvable, but solving them is left as an open problem. The second improvement is that it's actually enough for the degree of tau to be b squared times p times e. Because you can run the same attack as before, just when you're left with the eta part, then, of course, if eta has a small degree, you can recover it by some meet in the middle algorithm. But even if uh, the two curves in, in that part of the attack are not close, but one of them is close to the other one's conjugate, you can still recover the isogeny by applying for Benius and then applying the meet in the middle algorithm. So this changes the equation from b squared to b squared p. And this again imposes a modulo p condition now. So you need to choose c and d to be divisible by p. You make this choice and then uh, you divide by p and set c equals to zero. And then solving this equation is again a very similar one as, as before. 
you solve modulo a square, and then what you, you hope that what you get is the sum of two squares. The importance of this lesson is that this is much less reliant on p. Because essentially by setting c equals to zero, you only have one p in the equation. And this leads to a solution, so this uh, method succeeds whenever b is bigger than square root of p times a square. Modulo some technical details, which uh, for that, uh, see the full version of the paper. So why is this important? Because you could bring down the exponent of p from one to one half, uh, but the, then the exponent of a went up from one to two. But this is particularly important for SIDH-like parameter choices where p is uh, the biggest factor in the equation. So all these conditions were concerned with polynomial time attacks, but you can also look at attacks which are exponential time, but are faster than generic pathfinding algorithms. And we have derived two types of methods for, for dealing with this situation. One is that, of course, you can increase uh, the size of E, and then uh, the cost of the attack is just the, the, the cost of finding a degree E isogeny, because all the other parts of the attack are polynomial time. The other one is you can also guess part of the secret isogeny, which will reduce A, and then run the torsion point attack. And then, of course, it, the attack can fail if the first guess was wrong. And if it fails, then you choose a different uh, uh, guess. And guessing a degree D isogeny uh, will give you a factor D in complexity. So now let me show two graphs which show the evolution of uh, torsion point attacks throughout the years. So the first is uh, the 2017 attack by Petit. So in this graph, uh, you have two axes, an axis alpha and an axis beta, where A is roughly P to the alpha and B is roughly P to the beta. So now you want conditions on alpha and beta on, uh, when you have improved attacks. So in this uh, graph, the red line symbolizes and above the red area symbolizes polynomial time attacks, and the orange line and above symbolizes better than generic attacks. As you can see, the original attack didn't affect uh, any SIDH or B-side-like parameter choices, because so the line, uh, the dotted line connecting the two ones corresponds to SIDH-like parameter choices, and the dotted line connecting the two twos corresponds to B-side-like parameter choices. And now our work, you can see, we have a much larger portion of uh, uh, the perimeter space covered here. So again, red line and above is polynomial time attacks. Orange line and above is better than generic attacks. And we have a new line here, which is the yellow line, which is better than known quantum attacks. And as you can see now, uh, certain SIDH and B-side like uh, choices are now affected by our attacks. So let me give some highlights uh, of, of this graph, which are the most important parameter choices uh, for which we have uh, certain attacks. So the first is a polynomial time key recovery when b is bigger than a to the fifth and p is roughly a times b, which is an SIDH-like parameter choice and it actually was chosen in some designs, most importantly a group key exchange with six or more parties. The second one is a polynomial time key recovery when b is bigger than a square uh, and uh, p squared is roughly a times b, which is a b-side like perimeter choice. Again, not chosen in b-side itself because there the, the parameters are cho chosen to be balanced. And then the third one is an improved quantum attack whenever b is bigger than a square, and p is roughly a times b, which again is an SIDH like perimeter choice. So, so far, all these attack uh, we're concerned with the special starting curve y squared equals x plus x. We can also ask the question whether you can specifically design starting curves for which you can solve SSIT in polynomial time or faster than generic algorithms. And the, the first result is whenever b is bigger than a square, then the answer to this question is affirmative. So you can actually construct uh, certain backdoor curves for which you can solve in society in polynomial time. What is to be noted here is that this condition is completely independent of P. So 
It only depends on the balance between B and A. So what is the main idea behind this attack? Is that instead of fixing the starting curve and then looking for some special endomorphism on it, you look for them together. You actually look for the endomorphism first in a quaternion form, and then you find the suitable super single optic curve which contains that endomorphism. How uh, does this change the conditions on equation solving? So you have the same equation as before in, in the first improvement method. And again, D has to be an integer, but A and B and C do not have to be an integer. They, it's enough for them to be rationals. What is to be noted that P times A squared plus P times B squared plus C squared has to be an integer. The reason behind that is that that quantity will be the norm, or otherwise, uh, in quaternion terms, the norm of theta, or in isogeny terms, the degree of theta. And uh, the, you, you will be looking for a theta which has trace zero. And how do you solve this equation? So first, again, you solve modulo a square, which actually will give you the condition uh, that b has to be bigger than a square. Because what you want is, is, is afterwards an equa uh, equation where the right-hand side has to be positive. Because on the left-hand side, you will have p times a square plus p times b square plus c square, which even if you choose... Uh, rational A, B, and C will always be a positive number. And then once the right-hand sign is positive, then the only other condition for this to be solvable over the rational is that it has to be a quadratic residue modulo P, which happens half the time. So if it's not, then you choose a different D and you iterate as you did before. And then, so once you've solved this equation, you, you, you have found the theta in the quaternion form. Uh, and then what you do is you find the maximum order containing that particular quaternion, and then you translate it uh, to a super single optic curve. So to understand the solution step for this problem, this is essentially uh, any theta is good, which has a particular uh, minimal polynomial. In this context, it's actually all thetas are good for which theta square is equal to minus t. So essentially, AB backdoor curves are curves which have an endomorphism ring which contains a copy of uh, Z square root of minus T. And we show that uh, the number of these maximum orders is actually exponential in log P, which uh, gives an indication that it's probably hard to distinguish uh, a random curve from a backdoor curve without knowing any, any information about its endomorphism ring. And again, the condition that B has to be bigger than A square applies to polynomial time attacks. So you can again look at special backdoor curves for which you don't have a polynomial time attack, but you have an exponential time attack, which is still better than generic attacks. And the result there is actually that even for balanced parameters, you can construct backdoor curves for which you can beat existing attacks. Uh, we also discuss other backdoor uh, issues in the paper, such as backdoor parameters A and B and backdoor base field parameters, which I won't be discussing in this talk. So to conclude, uh, we have made significant improvements to previous attacks. Most prominently, we have an attack whenever B is bigger than A to the fifth and P is roughly A times B, uh, which uh, breaks a certain group key exchange with six or more parties. We had introduced the concept of backdoor curves, uh, which is an important concept for future designs and actually can also be used in a constructive fashion. Our methods can serve as sort of a benchmark for SIDH and B side like parameter choices uh, for future uh, crypto systems. And finally, uh, we advise against using starting curves coming from shady sources. Thank you.